Hi, my name is Ryan Edmonds, and I'm going to be talking about the Eisenstein integers. So to construct the Eisenstein integers, we want to start with a cube root of unity. So we'll let omega be equal to negative 1 plus root negative 3 over 2. And now we'll do a plus b omega, where a and b are integers. And that will give us this entire set of Eisenstein integers. So you see here, if we just look on the complex plane, 1 would be over here, omega would be over here. And then omega squared would be down in this corner. But we actually see that if we do out the math, omega squared um, can be written in terms of sort of a plus b omega if you let both a and b be negative 1. So this point down here, uh, omega squared, is also part of the Eisenstein integers. So this ends up forming sort of a triangular lattice on the complex plane where any of these intersecting points can be represented as an Eisenstein integer. So the first thing is just to show, let's just start with showing that this is a ring. So we're just going to show uh, closure under addition and multiplication. Other things like associativity and distributivity kind of come out of the complex numbers and the integers. So if we just add, uh, you know, we just rearrange parentheses and that ends up working out. A plus C and B plus D are both integers, so that's okay. And then if we do multiplication, as long as we rewrite omega squared in terms of negative 1 minus omega, we can end up with this here where we still have that each of these parentheses is an integer. So we stay inside the Eisenstein integers. And we are good to go with it being a ring. So the big result I want to look at is showing that this is a Euclidean domain. So the first thing we're going to do is define a norm. Uh, so we want a norm that sends everything to a positive integer and only sends things to only sends 0 to 0. So we'll do this by multiplying an Eisenstein integer by its conjugate. So we'll do a plus b omega times a plus b omega squared. And that ends up giving us a squared minus ab plus b squared. So this is definitely an integer. So now we just want to show that it's non-negative and only 0 when the input is 0. So if we do some algebra, we complete the square. So we'll rewrite this number. We'll add b over 2 squared and subtract b over 2 squared we end up with this term out here. And now since this is the sum of two squares, it's definitely non-negative. And it can only equal 0 when b is 0 on the right here. And then because of that, it also means that a has to equal 0. So now we have a norm only sends 0 to 0. Everything else is a positive integer. So now we want to do a division algorithm. So we want uh, with alpha and non-zero beta, we want to satisfy alpha equals q beta plus r, where the norm of r is less than the norm of beta. So the first thing we're going to do is just sort of naively divide in the complex numbers. We'll multiply by the conjugate just to make things pretty. And we end up with this kind of ugly term here, where we'll just consolidate to be x plus y omega. Note that this is not an Eisenstein integer, because x and y are going to be rational numbers instead of integers. So this is not guaranteed to be an Eisenstein integer. But we're going to restrict ourselves back into that domain now. So we still have this x plus y omega. And we're just going to round those to the nearest integer. So we'll choose m and n such that the difference between them and their respective values is less than or equal to 1 half. So now we can write q equals m plus n omega. And we'll just write r to be alpha minus q beta. So that just sort of defines r in the way that allows us to immediately conclude that alpha equals q beta plus r. So now we have that part of the division. And now we just need to confirm if the norm of r is less than the norm of beta. And we can do this with a visual proof by looking at the triangular lattice on the complex plane. So let's just choose some gamma and place that point here. And let's look at this parallelogram that we can create. So if we just assume beta is here, that would beta would be 3 plus omega would land you here. And then if you do gamma plus omega times beta, you would end up over here. And then if you add the both of them, you end up up here. So for any beta, if you plot these four points, you end up with this rhombus here. And what this actually means is that the entire complex plane can be tiled by these rhombuses. So any point on the plane without loss of generality is going to live inside one of these shapes. So if we just let gamma prime be equal to gamma plus beta, we could just move up here and make a new rhombus sort of going out up into the right from here. So now we can say that alpha has to live inside this. Uh, we can just choose gamma to be whatever makes alpha live in this rhombus. So now 
with our division algorithm, since we just sort of naively divided and then rounded to the nearest integers, we actually get that Q is equal to this closest point on the rhombus. And R ends up reflecting sort of the diff, the remainder of the difference between them. But what we can actually notice here is that since alpha has to live inside here, and R is the distance from alpha to the nearest point, this can never be bigger than beta itself. Because in order for this distance to be bigger than beta, alpha would have to live somewhere else, maybe outside of the rhombus or just maybe over here. But if that was the case, then we would have rounded to a different Q. So the bounds of how far away alpha can be from the closest point is bounded by a distance that's actually less than beta. And so if we look at that in the norm form, since that's what our norm is sort of representing in the complex plane, we end up seeing that given this algorithm, the norm of R is always going to end up being less than the norm of beta. And that will complete our proof of this division algorithm, which gives us a Euclidean domain. And then it also gives us principal ideal domain and unique factorization domain. So just a quick example of going through a division here. Uh, we're just going to take alpha equal to 7 plus 3 omega, beta equal to 1 plus 2 omega. We'll just do this division out in the rationals, get negative 1 third minus 11 thirds omega. We round to the nearest integers, we get m is 0 and n is negative 4. So then we end up with q is negative 4 omega. We calculate out r to be negative 1 minus omega. And then if we plug this back in, we see that q times beta plus r does indeed equal alpha. And the norm of r is 1, while the norm of beta is 3. So we definitely have that the remainder has a smaller norm than beta. So to wrap up, I want to quickly look into what prime numbers look like in the Eisenstein integers. So the first thing to do to take a look at this is we're going to quickly show that n is multiplicative. So we have the norm of the product of two numbers. This is, sorry, this is supposed to be a plus. Uh, and we'll, we want to show that this is equal to the norm of this one times the norm of this one. So if we just expand it out, this is what the product of the two integers looks like. And if we just sort of keep expanding this all the way out, we get this kind of ugly answer here. But we can cancel out a lot of like terms. And that ends us up with this slightly nicer term that ends up reducing to this product here, which is actually the norm of a plus b omega times the norm of c plus d omega. Having done that, now that the norm is multiplicative, uh, this also, as a side note, gives us the conclusion that the units in the Eisenstein integers are those things with norm 1, which are just plus or minus 1, plus or minus omega, and plus or minus omega squared, just written in this form. So now let's take a look at what prime numbers would be. And another note here is that if you actually wind through any Eisenstein integer um, and you try to compute its norm and you restrict yourself to mod 3, uh, a squared minus AP plus B squared will never come out to equal 2 mod 3. So that actually gives us sort of something interesting here, where since we know that any prime number, uh, actually any prime number will have norm P squared, but we're going to particularly look at those primes that are congruent to 2 mod 3. Since this has norm P squared, the only way it can be reducible is if the product of two Einstein integers equals P squared. That means they both have to have norm p, because otherwise one of them would be a unit. You can't have 1 times p squared. That won't work. But since we have that the norm of anything can't be congruent to 2 mod 3, this actually allows us to conclude that regular prime numbers that are congruent to 2 mod 3 do still count as Eisenstein primes. Unfortunately, this isn't the case with primes congruent to 0 or 1 mod 3. So we see here is 3 is equal to this product, and 7 is equal to this product. Uh, but you'll note that the factors of these numbers have the same norms. So this is still working out where the norm of 3 is 3 squared, and it factors into two things with norm 3. So in general, prime numbers that can be written in this form will factor in this particular way, where these two things actually do end up being primes themselves. So we end up with the two criteria for Eisenstein primes, either regular primes can be to 2 mod 3, and sort of everything that can be multiplied with a unit, or Eisenstein integers with prime norms. And the sort of as a side note, the largest known Eisenstein prime is sort of this number here, just sort of because all larger primes are actually Mersenne primes, which are congruent to 1 mod 3. And I just thought that seemed interesting. But that will wrap it up on the Eisenstein primes. And thank you for listening.